Good afternoon, everyone. Allison Scobbert here with Consolidated Planning Group. We are happy to be here today um, for the first time with Tyler and Madura. Did I say that right? Mater. Mater. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm terrible with that, but thank you for um, clarifying. Um, today, we are in webinar mode, and what, me, what that means to everybody is we can't see you or hear you, but we do know you're there. Our chat box is open today, so we do invite everybody to put their questions in the chat box. Um, today's meeting is being recorded, and you are going to get a copy of today's slides, so you don't have to take notes on every single thing you hear. You're going to get a copy of the slides with any links uh, that are in them, as well as a link to the recording. For anybody that is joining us by podcast and you would like a copy of today's slides, you can get that by emailing us at contact at cpgcares.net. That's contact at cpgcares.net, or you can call our office at 281-690-1177. So we're glad that each and every one of you are here with us today. Today we're talking about understanding the Social Security Administration programs and the benefits of establishing a trust. And I know we've had a lot of webinars on um, social security matters, and this is near and dear to a lot of people's hearts. And, this, and there's a lot of confusion that comes along with this. So we hope uh, to uncover some of that today and, and provide some clarifications. But again, please do put your questions in the chat box. We're gonna take those questions throughout the presentation. And if you have that question, probably somebody else does too. Um, Consolidated Planning Group is a holistic special needs financial planning firm. We're nationally certified as Social Security Advisors, members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. We are an advisory and consulting firm. Um, the differences of what we do and what, for instance, they do um, is we're the money, they're the paper, they're the legal documents, they're the, the law representation and we're the money. How much money do we need to fund a special needs trust? Um, how and when you know, should we apply for the various programs? How do we have money in the right buckets uh, to make sure that we preserve the um, eligibility for the very programs that we're discussing today? We help people set up um, protection plans, lifetime care plans, we do a lot of transition planning. We help set up ABLE accounts, which is an account uh, that is not counted in, against an individual for um, SSI and Medicaid purposes. And we do a lot of advocacy um, by way of our webinars. So you guys can check out our YouTube channel. Um, it's Consolidated Planning Group YouTube. There's over 350 webinars on planning for special needs. If you can think of a topic, it's out there. Um, and that is just um, out there of my own heart. Um, we want to educate and empower parents to have the tools and resources uh, that they need to achieve the su success that they want for their loved one with a disability. So um, having said that, thank you again for being here with us and I would like to turn things over to you. All right. Hi, I'm Digit Tyler and I'm gonna be doing the uh, portion of this program about social security disability and SSI. I have been practicing social security law for a little over 14 years, and I'm very happy to be here and, and give you all some information. So when you talk about disability programs through social security, there's actually two separate programs. There's social security disability, which is based on the taxes someone has paid in over the work life. And then there is supplemental security income or SSI, which is based on the income and assets of the individual. All right, so for both programs, you first have to be found disabled. And for an adult, it's all about, there's a really long definition there. I'm not gonna read it to you out loud, but in summary, you have to prove someone cannot work full time for at least 12 months. Um, so it's all about your ability to work. For the child, it's more about functional impairments. So they're looking at the child's ability to acquire information, to care for themselves, to um, be around other people, and it's based on their age. So what should a, a six-year-old be doing that, they, that they're not able to do? All right, so Social Security Disability Insurance. It's called an insurance program in that it insures your wages if you become disabled. So as you work a W-2 job or you're paying into Social Security, you, that's how you become qualified for this program. Once you get it, you get a monthly benefit. The max right now is 3,822. It will vary, it just depends on how much money you've made. And you will also get Medicare once you've been on the benefits for at least 24 months. 
So as far as how you get qualified, first, you have to be found disabled, like we talked about earlier, and then you have to have enough taxes paid in. So my rule of thumb is if you're over the age of 31, you need to have at least worked five out of the last 10 years because you have to have at least 20 work credits in the past 10 years. Um, and every year it goes up and down or it goes up of how much uh, you have to pay in that year in order to get your credit. And you can only get four credits a year. Now, the only way you can get Social Security disability if you have not worked long enough is to be qualified under the Adult Disabled Child Program. And what that is, is once someone turns 18, um, it's the first time they can apply, and they have to be found disabled before the age of 22. And if the child is disabled before the age of 22, if they have a parent on any type of Social Security benefit, or they have a parent who has passed away, they can draw off of that parent's um, Social Security earnings. So it's 50% of the earnings if the um, parent is on Social Security, and it's 75% if they have a parent who's passed away. Is it, this is where there's some confusion, because you know the Social Security Administration, we have all these acronyms for all these programs, and it only would make sense that if I have a disabled child that they would qualify for Social Security disability, and I think oftentimes people are very confused by this. So I want to clarify what you just said. So basically, um, the, the Childhood Disability Benefit Program used to be called um, Disabled Adult Child. It's the only way typically they're going to qualify for SSDI. It's the other program that, that the kids typically um, qualify for. So these SSI, SSDI, it sounds the same, but they're very, very different programs. So one thing I want to mention here, too, is that when people apply, they're applying for both SSI, SSDI. And what happens typically is they get a letter in the mail pretty promptly saying that they were denied for SSDI, um, and it's because the child didn't have enough work credits. So they were rightfully denied for SSDI, and a lot of times parents feel pretty overwhelmed by that letter. But what that letter doesn't say is that they're still considering the person for SSI, and that is, you know, kind of down the road. Have you, have you seen that issue come up uh, before as well? Yes. And, you know, even for people who aren't minor children, you know, a lot of times I'm applying for both programs and it becomes very overwhelming. And so what I tell people is you look at the top left hand corner of the letter and does it say supplemental security income or does it say survivors disability and retirement? And I have my clients sort those into two different piles and read them separately. Um, you know, when I'm helping a client, though, as soon as I get those letters, I call them and say, hey, this letter was expected, but the SSI case is still pending. But Social Security does not take the time to explain that to people. Um, that's why it's so important to really have an advocate who deals with Social Security on a regular basis. That's a really good advice. And I know that I've received letters from, from both. And the thing is, is the font is the same, the print. I mean, it just looks the same. So if you're really not looking close at the top left-hand corner, uh, you could miss exactly who it's from. It is a little bit confusing. So thanks for clarifying that. Looks like, uh, let's see if we have a question here. Um, isn't there an issue here with Family Max? Um, since I applied for Social Security, my, my spouse receives near half, and our disabled child, we've been told, will only receive a portion, not half, due to the Family Maximum. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so the Family Maximum, it's different for everyone. It's based, again, on how much you've paid in. And there is a maximum. So I don't, I don't know if you can call and ask. I normally see it on the earning statement. It will tell you exactly how much the family max is. So sometimes the child or the spouse will not be getting the full additional amount that they could because there is a cap based on the taxes they've been in. So if it's $5,000 is the max, then those benefits are going to be smaller based on how much, depending on how much the actual individual is already getting off their own record. And they do have information on the Social Security website about family maximums, and I have looked at it before, and it is confusing. And I think it, it says somewhere from 150 to 188 percent. So, like, it's this range. It's not like this finite no, I would uh, recommend formula. That. I so the, yeah, you want to get the actual number. We all have a number. Um, if you go to ssa.gov and create a My Social Security account, you can see it. Um, and so I look, I look at it for people quite often so I can kind of help them gauge how much I think they're actually going to get. So those numbers are the maximum someone's going to get, but they they can be reduced depending on how many people are drawing off of the earnings record and how much money they made. Someone making $30,000 a year family maximum is going to be quite different than someone who made 
$300,000 a year. And it's, and it's very, you know, they look really heavily at your past 10 years. So sometimes if you made a lot of money, but it's been 10 years, it could even be changed and reduced at that point. So you, I wouldn't try to calculate it on my own because it's too complicated. I would always go straight to social security and look at the number. All right, so the FSI program is different in that it's all about income and assets. So right now the current maximum is 943 a month and some states do supplement. So in Texas, we don't get extra money, but in California, they will provide extra money on top of the SSI. So it's worth looking at. And to get SSI, you do have to be disabled, blind, or 65 and above. So once you get 65, if you meet the other qualifications, you can get it without proving disability. There are some non-financial requirements. For example, for the most part, you have to be a citizen. There are some permanent residents who will qualify, but it's, it's very few. Um, so generally it's a citizenship that you would need to have. You can't be in prison and you can't leave the country for more than 30 days. And you have to apply for all other social security benefits that you may be eligible for. So for example, in the prior situation we talked about, even though the child may get less, they have to apply for that before they can also apply for SSI. To get um, SSI, you have to meet those requirements we just discussed. Then you have to be found disabled and be or be 65. And then it looks at your resource and income. So your resource, they look at one time a month. So for example, if they looked at it on February 1st, those are gonna be your resources for that month where income, they're gonna look at all the income you receive at the continuous um, calculation based on that month. So we have another question. Um, if my DAC and my spouse both receive benefits on my record uh, and I continue to work after my full retirement age, will the family max increase due to my uh, new earnings? It definitely can, because if you're paying in, it's going to redo that calculation. Okay, and one more question. So I, if I have an adult child, age 20, who just got SSI for persons or elderly with, dis with a disability, once my husband starts drawing Social Security, it will reduce her amount. Am I understanding that right? So if you, once your child, so let's say the husband retires, then your child will need to apply for the DAC benefit that we just discussed. And once they figure out that amount, it will reduce the SSI income, yes. But they can get Medicaid. But they get the higher amount. So they end up getting the higher amount, is, so it's not the... The, the disabled adult child amount plus SSI, but they end up getting what the higher amount is. And sometimes, depending on what that 50% um, that amount is, a, a person, your child may still be getting some SSI and some disabled adult child benefit under the parent's record. You could have both. And in about three cases a year, Gidget, I see a, a, an individual who they're getting um, a little bit of SSI DAC benefits or childhood disability benefits under a parent's record, but they have also worked some and have enough credits and they're actually getting some um, SSDI under their own record, but they haven't earned over that substantial gainful amount. That makes sense. Yes, yeah. that can happen. Even with adults, I mean, you, they can get SSI and SSDI at some point. And we're going to kind of go into the income questions a little bit in a minute and to see how that's calculated. So first with the resources, you have to look at an individual, you can only have $2,000 or less in non-exempt assets. And if you're married, you can have up to 3,000. And like I said, they're gonna look once a month at that to see if you're over that limit. So if you're over the limit, it's gonna disqualify you for that entire month. And this is kind of what, what we're getting to all go. So there's four types of income that SSI is gonna look at. So one is unearned income, gifts, um, child support is a big one that I see that affects people, annuities and that sort of thing. So you get $20 for free, but after that, it's a dollar for dollar reduction. So something like SSI is, uh, I mean, that benefits are unearned income. So you get $20 for free and then it's going to reduce your SSI dollar for dollar. And then there's earned income, which is going to be more if you're working or self-employed. You get seven or sixty-five dollars for free, and then every two dollars it reduces it by a dollar. So you get a lot more leadway with the earned income. Um, I just want to go back and um, back a slide a second for the resource limit because sometimes this is really important. So 
you know, a lot of families like to save money for their kid and they may have a, a savings account for the child or whatever. So it's really, really important that before you apply for SSI, you make sure that their accounts, all things, the secret savings bonds that you forgot about that grandma and grandpa bought 15 years ago, that all adds up to that $2,000. And so one question that I get um, is, what do I do now? I have more money. And so, first of all, don't just go close the account. They're hip to that. That is not a legitimate move to just go close the account and take the money out. What you can do is you can spend down the money for the benefit of said child. Um, you can move money um, to an ABLE account, um, you know, up to the limits of the ABLE account um, for the year, which for 2024 is $18,000. Um, and if it is the child's money, then that money can also be moved into a first party special needs trust, which I know they're going to talk more about. But I just want to mention this because I think a lot of people's tendencies are, okay, I'm just going to close that account. Um, but they go back and look at that. So it is important to do it the right way as far as, it, as, far as if you're over that $2,000. You definitely want to do that. And you said something uh, a moment ago uh, that is important, we talk about this a lot on our webinars because people don't really think about it being income to the child, but you talked about child support. Um, so this is a big thing. A lot of times we see child support in Texas that continues post age 18 for an individual with a disability. And we see a lot of families apply for SSI and get denied because, the, um, because that child support has not been redirected um, to that first party special needs trust. And so I know you guys are going to talk more about that, but just know guys, if you have child support that's not going to a first party special needs trust, that is a matter that does need to be addressed before you apply for SSI. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so the other two kinds of income that really seem to impact a lot of my clients is in-kind support and maintenance, this is if your disabled person in your life is living with you and they're not paying rent, they're going to deduct up to a third of their benefit. So it's really important that you have a lease agreement um, or some kind of agreement that they're going to pay you rent and pay for their fair share. I would definitely reach out to an attorney or someone to help you make sure you get that correct. And then deemed income, this is what stops the majority of minor children who have disabilities from actually getting benefits until they turn 18. So if someone has a duty to support you, their income is going to be deemed to you. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Okay, so the big ones that get deemed are minor to minor, or from parents to minor, and then spouse to spouse. So until your child turns 18, all of your income and assets is counted against them. And that's why the majority of children do not qualify for SSI benefits. However, the minute they turn 18, even if they're still living in your house, you no longer have to count that income against you. So quite frequently, I help parents right before they're 18, we're getting everything ready so we can file the minute they turn 18. And then of course your spouse. So if you're married um, and you haven't worked long enough to qualify for social security disability um, and you're looking at SSI, we have to look at the spouse's income and assets before we move on um, with the application. So the question that we get all the time on this is if they're over 18, you already said, even if they're living in your house, um, the question that we get is, what if they're under full guardianship? Does it still only count their income? And what if, um, what if the parent claims the kid on their taxes? Does that change anything? Those are the no. big questions that come up. Neither one. Both of them are fine. So you can claim them on your taxes and if they have a guardian. So I did want to go back. Um, as far as the asset limits, you know, everyone can have a residence, a principal residence, and they can have... Um, one vehicle per family. Sorry, you know, I mean, we kind of talked about the assets earlier. You can keep going forward and go to the next one. So the other exempt assets are household items, personal effects, musical instruments, barrel insurance. So there are some things that you don't have to, that they will exempt from that $2,000 and $3,000 limit. Okay, so SSI or Medicaid. So when you get SSI, for the most part, you're gonna get Medicaid. Now, there are three different types of states, so it's important, depending on where you are, to know what you need to do to get that Medicaid. So in 1634 states, as long as you're getting a dollar of SSI, you're going to get Medicaid. Um, Texas, for example, is one of those states. And SSI criteria state, it's really the same, but you have to take the extra step to put in 
put in an application for Medicaid. And then the most restrictive states are 209B states, and you still have to put in a separate application, and it's not guaranteed that you will get Medicaid. They could have extra criteria added to it. And the next slide will show you just in case, depending on where you are, where your states fall. All right, so the process of applying, once we, you talk to someone, you're like, okay, I'm ready to apply. So what happens? So the initial application, everything is the same except the initial application. So the initial application can be submitted online at ssa.gov. Um, SSI, they're working on a full electronic application, but they haven't done that yet. So it's a paper application. I do it here in the office and send it in for you. Or if you're going to do it without an attorney, you can contact your local office for an appointment or you can submit um, a request to have an appointment essentially done for you. Um, but it will have to be done through the Social Security Administration. So what happens once you apply for the benefits is it goes from your local office to Austin. That's where the medical decisions are made. Once it gets there, they're going to request additional paperwork. Um, they're going to request medical records. They may send you to a doctor. Right now, it's taking about 10 to 12 months to get an initial decision. And if you are denied, then we will appeal it to reconsideration. Um, once it gets there, it's the same DDS office in Austin, but you will get a new caseworker and you can submit new evidence. And if you're denied again, then you go see the judge. So I would go through that really quickly to say the majority of people end up seeing a judge before they're approved. And I like to be very upfront about the length of this process. So if you go see a judge, you're looking at about a two-year process. So as soon as you know that you're not going to be able to work or that your child is not going to be able to work, you want to file pretty immediately because Texas um, specifically is very backlogged right now. Now, if you were to get denied for the judge, the last administrative appeal you can do is the Appeals Council, which is in Virginia. And then if you get denied there, your only option is to actually sue the Social Security Administration in district court, um, which, which does happen. And the district court's rates of approval are actually higher than the Appeals Council. So sometimes you do just have to take it up. Um, so that's just a quick overview of the process because I want people to understand the administrative steps of that. Um, and I think after that, Carly's going to take over about things you should do once you are approved. Yes, um, yes. Talk to us about, can, it, can, we, can we talk about um, when a person, you know, should hire a, a firm like yours? Like I think of, you know, I think of clients of ours, you know, a surgeon or somebody very, very busy job-wise may not have the time to sit on the phone for hours on end with the Social Security Administration that clearly, you know, maybe appeals and hearings and things like that. Um, talk, talk to us about, you know, when is a good idea um, to bring, you know, your team on board um, if, if they need help? Well, my favorite, what I prefer is to do the initial application because what people do not understand is that the function reports and the work history reports that are done at that initial application level seem very innocent and almost every denial I get at a hearing level is going to quote something that was written on those forms. Now, I will say this, as far as for sure when you should do it, I would say after the initial denial, because the reconsideration denial rate is 89%. So most likely, if you do not get into the initial application stage, you don't get approved, you're going to the hearing. And the longer an attorney has the case, the more time we have to build up the evidence um, in the case so it's ready to go once it gets in front of the judge. Because it used to take a year to get a court date, so we had time, but hearings are actually happening a lot quicker now. So if I only have a case for two or three months, it's really hard to build up enough evidence if I feel like the case isn't ready yet to see the judge. So initial application, if you feel comfortable doing it, I, I think you can try. But the minute you get denied, I would hire an attorney before reconsideration. Okay. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, too, is the Social Security Blue Book. This is a medical impairment guide that the Social Security Administration uses to determine you know, basically whether or not a person, the criteria that they're looking for to see if your loved one meets to be quote unquote determined disabled. So the Social Security Blue Book is online and you can look, um, and I say look all of the impairments up. So if they have autism and a variety of other diagnoses, don't forget those other diagnoses. So look them all up. So the Social Security Blue Book. And then we had a question in the chat box, um, Gidget, about you know, what medical documents should we get ready? So prior to applying um, for SSI, do you have any recommended documents that parents should get ready before the application? 
So the most important thing is to make sure you're going to the doctor and you're reporting all your symptoms. And what I mean by that is sometimes, like let's say it's a, a genetic um, disability, they kind of don't start reporting the symptoms as much or the if you stop reporting or going to the doctor beforehand because you feel like no one's going to help you, that actually hurts your social security case. So make sure you're going to the doctor frequently. Um, and then there are certain forms that I like to get done. So I have assessments for almost every disability out there. So if someone has epilepsy, I have a seizure form that I like to have a doctor complete when I'm doing the application because most cases that are approved at the initial level are, are listing or blue book cases. And, um, it's not really easy to prove that your severity is, you have the severity that requires. So there's certain forms I like to get done. If you have doctors who are willing to write letters, um, really describing the medical impairments your, your person has. What is not helpful is a letter from your doctor saying, this person is disabled. Social security could care less because disability is a legal term, not a medical term. So social security wants to know how long can this person stand, walk, how much can they lift and carry, how long can they concentrate? So if you can, if you have a doctor that can really go through and describe their limitations, that is very helpful. Okay, a couple more. Um, what is the process to make corrections to the SSI initial application? For example, if I did not include info for the fair share or housing costs? When you get, first of all, for SSI, if you're still going through the process, they're going to do an interview at the end and ask for all those documents, and you can give them at that time. You can always contact the local office. They send a summary, or they should as well, where you can write on it and correct it and send it back. But realistically, at the end, they're going to ask for all that stuff again before they approve you, once you've been found disabled. Okay. And then we have um, another one that asks, um, and this is, I'm glad you put this in the chat box. Thank you for that. Do you suggest we apply for SSI six months before the child's 18th birthday? And we strongly advise against that because it's going to be based off of your income and assets prior to that time. So I know people like to get a head start because the Social Security Administration is behind, but it basically for most families, you're wasting your time and you're going to get denied and you're going to have to start over. I suggest one day after the 18th birthday. Uh, do you have any other additional suggestions on that, Gidget? No, uh, you have to wait till they're 18. Like I'll have people who are coming and talking to them and I have all their stuff and the day they turn 18, I send it off. Perfect. Okay, last question and then we're um, going to keep moving. Um, what if your child's condition is um, listed um, under the, the presumptive conditions for a compassionate allowance? What should we expect with that and the, the tracking of those applications? Right, so... The problem with Social Security right now is that there is a backlog on getting caseworkers. So once you have an actual caseworker, I would expect you to be approved quickly. It's just how long we can get in front of them. Now, if it's a compassionate allowance, it's considered a dire need case. So a presumptive case and a compassionate allowance aren't the same thing. So I would have to know a little bit more um, where it falls, but you want to make sure that you've notified them. So for example, if I file a case and it's a compassionate allowance case, um, I put it in the application. This is a compassionate allowance case. And I, and I like to attach the medical records that prove that diagnosis when I'm submitting it. Once it's submitted, then I start calling the DDS office to make sure, hey, is this case marked compassionate allowance? Or, hey, is this case marked um, a die or need case? And you want to just keep making sure it's marked correctly or else it'll you'll still fall into that 10, 12 month uh, for initial decision. Okay, last question um, we're going to take for right now. We'll come back. Um, let's see. Um, someone asked, do you get back pay if it takes two years for approval? Yes. So for SSI, your back pay starts the month after they receive the application. For Social Security Disability, it can actually go a year before the application if you were already disabled. Perfect. Thank you for answering all these questions. It's a, it's a lot. It's a lot of information and it's so confusing. So um, this is great. Keep your questions coming and we are going to um, switch over to Carly. Thank you, Gidget, for all of this information. It was awesome. Great. Hi, I'm Carly Mater. I'm the other principal attorney at Tyler and Mater. Um, if you'll go back one slide, um, Allison, we were, I was just going to kind of segue into, well, what happens after you, you know, receive those benefits? 
Um, now what? Are we done or do we have to do additional planning? And for SSDI, um, because it is not based on income, uh, as Gidget says, you could win the lottery and still not lose your benefits check. Um, it was based on, you know, you paying into for your work credit. Um, so do I need a supplemental needs trust if I'm on SSDI? No, um, but we still recommend a good estate plan, of course, uh, because we are estate planning attorneys. Uh, for SSI, so this is where it gets into, um, you know, the the supplemental needs trust and the special needs planning, because if your income does go above the allowable limit, as Gidget mentioned, um, then you're at risk of even either having your check reduced or losing it all together. And you're also at risk of losing Medicaid. Um, so for example, if you inherit from your parent, if you um, are a disabled adult child and you inherit too much from your parents, um, you know, what do you do uh, instead of um, at that time, trying to scramble and, and trying to not lose your benefits, start planning now. So that is what I'm going to speak about, um, the special needs planning aspect. And, and you can go to the next slide. I just want to mention um, for the SSDI. So we do have, so a lot of our families, we want to continue to keep them Medicaid qualified. Um, for the Medicaid waivers, and all states have Medicaid waivers. They may be called something else in other states, but they all have Medicaid waivers. And those Medicaid waivers, um, you still have to maintain Medicaid eligibility of less than you know, $2,000 or less in a person's name. So if you're getting something like the HCS waiver, Texas Home Living class, or something like that, even if you have retired and your child has switched over to SSDI or childhood disability benefits under a parent's record, it may still be very important for you to have the, the special needs trust and the ABLE account and things like that if you want to maintain their Medicaid eligibility. Some families do not care about the Medicaid eligibility and then, then maybe it wouldn't matter as much, but I just wanted to make a point that it does matter if you need that Medicaid waiver. Yeah, that's an absolutely great point. I have a client actually that I helped that was on a Medicaid waiver. Um, it was income based a, a certain amount. She was working. Um, so we did have to create a trust um, in that scenario as well. So yeah, so definitely um, I talked to an attorney about that and how to protect funds for even if you're on a Medicaid waiver, for sure. That was a great point, Allison. Thank you. Um, so special needs planning. Why did I get into this? Um, I was an estate planning attorney for um, a long time. And uh, then I uh, became pregnant and had my third daughter. That is Kennedy right there. You've seen a couple of pictures of her throughout the slides. Um, she was born with an extra chromosome. So she has some intellectual disability, some physical um, impairment, epilepsy. Um, so at 18, based on her diagnosis, and you know, we, she has a lot of medical records, as Gidget pointed out, um, she will qualify um, for SSI under that definition of dis disabled. Um, and at 18, Kennedy will have a um, kind of diminished intellectual capacity, uh, so she will not be able to care for herself or work. Um, so it is important to apply once she turns 18 for SSI and also so that she can get on Medicaid because, you know, I have a lot of parents, you know, ask me, well, is Medicaid really needed? They can be on our private insurance for, you know, 26, you know, until they're 26. Well, you know, for some day programs and for some even, um, you know, facilities, um, if, you know, your uh, child um, who has become an adult wants to have some independent living, they do require you to be on some type of Medicaid program um, and, and, and won't take private insurances, uh, believe it or not. So it is a good backup to always um, get that benefit because they're entitled to it. Um, yeah, you can go on the next slide. So for special needs planning, we always recommend to do a special needs trust. So even now when you know, Kennedy is only about to be seven years old. Um, I have created a special needs trust or what we'll talk about a supplemental needs trust. Um, so what is a trust? You know, a lot of people, um, that term is thrown around a lot and people sometimes get confused. So I just wanted a simplified version um, of what is a trust. It's, it's a great tool to create a separate, you know, entity, account, person. I mean, you know, just a, a separate identification, so to speak that allows the creators of the trust to appoint someone um, to help manage that trust property. And that, and we can go over you know, what that, um, that title is. Um, and then it's for the benefit of someone else, typically. Um, there's different examples of trust. We're gonna focus on the supplemental needs trust, but there's also management trust. Um, you know, if 
if you have a disabled child that is, you know, working and, and able to either one day qualify for SSDI or doesn't need benefits, um, but maybe they're not that great with financial planning, right? They're not that great at managing their own bank account. You can still have their bank account in a trust um, that someone else manages for them. It doesn't have to be a supplemental needs trust. It can be a management trust. Um, so there's a lot of trusts um, out there, and we'll focus on the, the supplemental needs ones for this um, presentation. So what do the words mean? Um, a lot of a lot of the times I hear, well, who's executor of my trust? That those aren't that's not you know the the best terminology. Executor is the executor of a will. So I wanted to just go over some of um, the the kind of the key words you hear when you think of a trust. The grantor or the trustor or the settler is the person that creates the trust, um, and they typically fund the trust. Other people can as well, but for the most part, that is the person that goes to the attorney and wants to establish that trust. Um, and then they appoint a trustee. A lot of the times the grantor um, can also be the trustee, um, uh, but it can also be a financial institution. Uh, it can be a CPA. It can be an attorney. It can be a bank. Um, it can also just be a loved one. The person does have a high standard of care and loyalty. They have to do what is best for the beneficiary. The beneficiary is the person that benefits from the trust. So those are those three key words that you'll hear. Okay, so now for this presentation, we're focusing on the Supplemental Needs Trust and Special Needs Planning. Um, as Gidget mentioned, the, the individuals who meet the definition of disability will be eligible for um, the needs-based program as long as their um, income is below the limit, their resource and income test. Um, and so if you do qualify and you get on SSI um, and you're eligible for Medicaid or if you have a Medicaid waiver, um, then, you know, now what? Well, if you have, you know, a uh, money or accounts, uh, like Allison mentioned, already in that child's name, um, then you're going to have to uh, uh, create what's called a first party special needs trust. Um, in order to prevent that from happening, uh, you should really start planning now. So if you have a child like I do, that's Kennedy in, a, in, in the picture again, she's getting some physical therapy. Um, we created what's called a standalone special needs trust or a third party trust so that she won't inherit from our estate, my husband and I, um, if anything were to happen to us. We don't wanna list Kennedy in our will outright, um, and we don't want to let her inherit from us outright. We want to put it all into her trust. So we literally just call it the Kennedy Supplemental Needs Trust. Um, we also put contingent supplemental needs language in all of our wills at Tyler and Mater, uh, because you know, as a lot of special needs parents out there know, you you never know when your child is going to become disabled. Um, you know, some people, as Gidget mentioned, they don't even get the diagnosis until they're, you know, 15 years old. Um, and then they start seeing some issues or all of a sudden they have an epilepsy diagnosis and it's very debilitating. So, you know, we always put that kind of contingent language in there to make sure that, hey, if any, if any of my beneficiaries in my will um, are at the time of my death receiving SSI or Medicaid, and they need a supplemental needs trust so that they don't get kicked off their benefits, then that will is going to point to that trust and create that trust um, instead of going outright to the person on those need-based programs um, so that we don't you know, disrupt those benefits. Um, and then the intent of the supplemental needs trust, I always say it's all in the name. It's to supplement the life of the person um, that is receiving SSI um, and or Medicaid. So for example, you know, SSI says that, you know, you get the check for, you know, food and shelter, right? So your supplemental needs trust should not pay for food and shelter. You should, you know, kind of earmark that for your SSI benefit check. Um, same with Medicaid. Medicaid pays for medical um, uh, needs. So, you know, but all three of those things are kind of essentials that uh, the person, you know, gets uh, or maintains eligibility for. But there's so much more expenses, as, as we all know, um, for, you know, someone, especially with disabilities, extra medical equipment um, that Medicaid does not cover, um, you know, certain medications, you know, even a cell phone, clothing, shoes, you know, uh, utilities at the home, right, like cable, TV, internet. So you can use the funds that you set aside, just like a savings account in the supplemental needs trust to supplement the life of your child once they're on those benefits. We have a few um, trust-related questions. I was told that since my adult child gets SSI, that once we pass away, that the state of Texas will take half of everything. And this worries me because it's our girl's home. Um, can you confirm if that is there's truth to that? 
No, I'm sorry. The home? Is that what the question was? Or the trust? Yeah, they, they were told that if a person was getting SSI, that when they die, that the, the, the state will take half of everything. No, that is not true. Um, they might be referring to a Medicaid payback trust, which I'll, I'll, I'll explain in a minute. That's the first party trust. Okay, and another question is, do you have to report this trust to the IRS? To the IRS? No, any, I mean, you do have to pay taxes on a trust. So depending on your specific personal situation and your tax situation, which we do recommend to talk with the CPA about the trust you're establishing, um, but the way the trust is taxed does need to be reported. Um, any income producing um, that, the, that the trust you know, makes uh, has to be reported on either your um, tax, federal tax ID, uh, sorry, federal tax return, or if the supplemental needs trust is an irrevocable trust and it has its own tax ID, then yes, the, the trust will file um, its own federal income tax return. And we do have a CPA that's uh, nuanced in special needs trust that we refer to on a pretty regular basis. So if you need that, you can reach out. Um, someone says, I was told in another panel that we should not set up a special needs trust to activate until uh, my wife and I both passed away. Do you share this opinion? No, um, I, I will say that, you know, sometimes attorneys and even financial planners are weary of putting too much into the trust, right? Because um, if it's, you know, irrevocable, especially, you're going to have a higher um, tax burden. You can create special needs trusts as revocable trusts. Um, so, and then it doesn't become irrevocable until um, you're passing, um, the parent's passing. Um, but for example, I like to set up the trust now so that um, e even if you don't fund it exactly with a bank account or a savings account and you don't put a bunch in there, um, one, it is nice to have, like if you set up a special needs trust and, um, and have it has, have its own savings account, you can actually have friends and family, you know, write a check to that um, disabled child through that trust, and there's no limit on it. You can also do that through the ABLE account, which that that's another slide too that I go over. Um, but there's no limit to a third party supplemental needs trust amount. Um, you can also it, it it's a good way to name the trust if it's already established. It's a great way to name that trust in like a grandparents will um, or a siblings you know will if, if they're older. Um, so I do create it now, I, but you know, I'm not of the opinion that you have to fund it now. Um, but it is nice to at least even put it on beneficiary designations for like IRAs or life insurance policies. Um, so yeah, I hope that answered the question. Harley, I, we share your opinion uh, a thousand percent. Um, and another reason I would like to add is that if it's already established, you know, when somebody dies, there might be a crisis that's leading up to a death. And it could take a couple of months, a couple of weeks to get everything set up, whereas if it's already set up, it's good. And, and the other thing that you said, and I just wanted to reiterate this, because this is a big deal. If your trust isn't going to be set up to your death and your parents, your affluent parents die that want to leave money to your special needs child, it's an issue. Yeah. So having that set up, like you said already, then grandma and grandpa can set up, you know, leaving money to, directly to that trust. So I am a fan of that. Um, someone said, and I think we'll defer this, but they asked about, um, you know, would an ABLE account meet many of the same needs as the special needs trust? And then there are vast differences between those two accounts. So I'll let you um, get to that one and we'll come back to that. Um, and then the other person said, what happens to these trust accounts when the person dies? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. So for the third party um, supplemental needs trust, uh, you can, in the trust agreement, you can name contingent beneficiaries, which is a great benefit. I think that's, it, it's coming on, on those slides, but it's a great benefit of a third party supplemental needs trust is that you can leave it to your other children. So if that trust account has grown, if, if, if that trust account has inherited a bunch of money from like grandparents and, and there's a lot of funds in there and then, you know, you know, tragically your, your disabled child has passed away in that trust agreement, it does say that you can say exactly what happens to those funds and who gets it. Can you please just tell us why it wouldn't just be easier to leave everything to your other children with an agreement that they'll take care of them? Can you talk to us about some of the things that could happen like death and divorce or things like that where the kind of, as I call it, the wheels fall off the bus of that plan? 
Yeah, of course. You know, I think that um, kind of the the old old school way to do it, so so to speak, um, when we didn't have um, the, the the benefit of the supplemental use trust under like the tax code and the and the IRS and and um, and the trust code is that and and SSI. Um, is that people did that. They disinherited um, their loved ones that are receiving benefits because they said they can't have, you know, they can't inherit. They just can't. Let's disinherit, give it all to our other children. And for sure, they're going to, you know, take care of them. Well, you know, you can be absolutely sure of a person and their well intentions, but once you're gone, you're gone. I mean, in that moment, if that other child, even though it's a sibling and you would want them to do the absolute best for their other sibling, and, you know, maybe 90% of the time that that happens, but we've actually seen firsthand where that does not happen. Um, the child is just put into a, a home um, and kind of left there. Um, and, you know, oh, my child would never do that. But what if in that moment, you're right, that, that you know, that other child, that other sibling um, is going through a bad divorce and that, you know, that spouse is, try, is trying to take everything, Right. Or um, they they just got diagnosed with a very scary you know medical concern and all they were like oh now I have all this money I know I need to give some to but but she's okay right she she'll do fine in the in the public facility I got to keep more so we're not saying that like all people are bad or anything I mean that is an option um, for some families we would never recommend it um, but you know in very rare circumstances if that's something that they need to do because they cannot afford an estate planning attorney. Um, then, you know, I mean, that is, I mean, that, that, that is an option that people did in the past, but I think there was way more, um, kind of fraudulent activity, um, because of that, that thinking and that route that they took. You know, and furthermore, if they leave it to like the other, the other sibling or whatever, and that sibling dies, that money could become a part of that sibling's estate and be tied up that way as well. I mean, there's. Lots, lots of issues there. So thanks for talking issues, yeah. about and, that. And, 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 and if no one had a will and no one had a plan in place, then, you know, under laws of intestate, if they were married, it all goes to that spouse. Well, that spouse has absolutely no duty and maybe not even a, a you know, a, you know, any type of connection to the, um, the disabled, you know, person. So again, that's, that's a great point as well. Or if you're sued, if that person gets into a car accident, your asset, they can you know, or bankruptcy, there's just a lot of really negative parts of that. Mm -hmm. We would actually not recommend that for any child, uh, regardless of their of their disability or not. Um, you know, we, we don't, a lot of parents say, well, I'm going to leave my life insurance policy to the oldest sibling. The oldest sibling is just going to distribute it out because I don't, I don't need a will. I don't want to do anything like that. That almost never works ever. Um, and like you just said, there's, there's so many, there's so many stories that we've heard that that didn't work. Uh, it caused more fighting. Um, and, and that money was gone quick. I mentioned this a lot in our webinars about beneficiaries. We've been talking about wills and trusts and, you know, you have an executor, you have a trustee, but in your life insurance and investment accounts and bank accounts, you may have a transfer on death or payable on death or bank account or a beneficiary. The beneficiary trumps everything. So just so you know, if you have legal documents in place and you've spelled everything out, but you failed to change the beneficiaries on these contracts, the beneficiary trumps everything. So that's key to know. And then the other key thing to know is um, it's really important. And if you've done this, don't beat yourself up. You can fix this. A lot of people, they name their spouse as the beneficiary, and if I'm gone, if I die, and my spouse is already dead and gone, then that's easy. I'll just divide it equally amongst my children. It is so critically important not to name your child with a disability directly named as a beneficiary on anything you have, because it's most likely going to be more than $2,000, and then you're going to be over the limit. So that's why they're talking about the trust. So Check those beneficiary designations and check your old pension plans, old 401ks, 403bs, life insurance. You might have life insurance that you bought 35 years ago. Check those beneficiaries. Each of those companies have a change of beneficiary form that you can request for free, and you can update your change of beneficiary and also your HR department for any group life insurance and things like that. You can update those for free with your employers as well. Yes, absolutely. That's a great point. We had we we had a client that they had set up a family trust. They set up a special needs trust. He had contingent special needs language in his will. I mean, everything was great and drafted perfectly. 
And then he left his retirement account to all three of his children in equal shares. Well, two of them were receiving benefits. So, and it was outright to them personally. So we've, we've been there. We've, we had to fix things. It, it is fixable as I'll mention. Um, so kind of in those scenarios, if, if your child has um, received a big inheritance through like an IRA or a will um, outright in their name, um, then that is when you need to establish a first party special needs trust. It's also called a D4A trust. It's also called a Medicaid payback trust. Um, I'll go into more detail of that in the next slide. This is a good table of the difference between all of them. Third party S&T and first party s and they are they're very different and I'll go through exactly why they're different. Um, the first party was that what I just mentioned, it's kind of like the oops, what happened now they have too much money, but we can fix it. Um, there is downsides to that. So the third party is what the parents and grandparents that I typically work with will set up for that child with a disability um, so that they don't have to create a first party one day. Um, the pooled SNTs, this it goes through like the, the difference of these. Um, the pooled is when a nonprofit organization um, will pool resources of those trust funds and they, I mean, they um, become the trustee and manage um, those assets for the trust. And so if you'll go on to the next couple of slides, I can get in more detail of those or to show you the difference. Um, so then I'll go through this pretty quickly because I know um, it's getting a little um, or almost time's up. So the supplemental needs trust, like I said, if it's third party, just know that it's literally in the name, third party. It's someone other than the beneficiary's funds. It is third party funds. Um, it could be funded by the parent, the grandparent, anyone, a life insurance policy. It can be funded by third party as long as it's not the beneficiary's money. That is very important. And there's specific language in the trust agreement that has to be in there to make sure that it's not a first party trust. I have seen other attorneys works even that they send it to me. The parents think it's a third party trust. It's not. They have set it up as a first party. And that is it, it's something that, that could be very frustrating. And, and we'll get to why. The third party um, supplemental trust also a benefit of it is that it can be left to other children if that disabled child dies. So if the primary beneficiary dies, you can um, list secondary beneficiaries, which is great. Um, the beneficiary also cannot be the trustee and it cannot have any discretion. Like the, the disabled person cannot have discretion on how those funds should be distributed. I know that's kind of silly, especially if a beneficiary is very vocal. Um, of course, you're going to talk to them and, and things like that but there is language in the trust agreement that you'll see that they cannot have, you know, any say. So I just like to point that out. Um, and they cannot have, you know, any power to like revoke it. Um, it, it cannot be revoked by the beneficiary. Um, it can by um, the parents that create it. Um, and that's probably a, a different topic for a different day um, to get more into it. Um, but that is, that is kind of the requirements of the, the third party trust. I just wanted to mention, and you kind of hit on this, but, I always say that when it comes to your legal documents, this is not a do-it-yourself project. This is not your real estate attorney neighbor next door that says they're going to do it for you for free. Your, your situation is specialized. It is so critically important that you work with a specialist, work with attorneys that are specifically nuanced and working with people with disabilities and understand this stuff because I've seen it too where the third-party specialties trust had a Medicaid payback in it. I've seen some crazy wow. stuff. And um, it is it is shocking, but it really, really does happen. So do work with a specialist. You'll be glad you did. Um, one person asked, can you just give us a range? Inquiring people want to know. They want to know. They want to plan financially. So if a, a family was going to, you know, set up their legal documents with special needs trust, maybe they need the wills, so those five parts of the wills or whatever, and special needs trust. Can you give us a range of what a family can expect to pay to get these things set up? Yeah, our our kind of most basic, I would say, is 3,000 flat fee. Um, and, you know, we can we can also talk with parents about that. Um, there's ways to get that lower. There's ways to um, also plan for your other children. Um, and then the cost goes up. Um, and then there's some transfer deeds that we talk about as well. Um, so, but in the range there, um, I would say 2,500 to 3,500 is kind of where we tend to fall with um, clients. Um, as, as far as other attorneys charging a whole bunch more, um, we don't know why, and it is sad, and I, I don't think you should um, pay upwards of you know, $5,000 um, for a special needs plan, unless there's things that like need to be discussed, like taxes and, 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 and a lot of other things, or a blended family or something like that, then I can see maybe people charging more, but um, 
hopefully, you know, shop around, like get, get the people that know what they're doing, but also not charging you so much money just because you put special needs on it. For sure. For sure. Okay. So um, we'll just keep moving on for now. Yeah. I think I've been through this one. Um, the, the big benefit of a third party uh, supplemental needs trust is no requirement to pay back Medicaid. So a first party trust, what I mentioned that we will have to establish if the person inherits in their name and we have to get it out of their name, we can create under you know SSI um, rules, we can create a first party supplemental needs trust to protect those funds. But if those funds are not depleted, before the disabled person passes away, then anything that Medicaid has paid for that um, disabled person throughout their life, they get paid back. So most of the time it depletes that trust. So you're not able to then pass it on to your other siblings or other people that you want to, or their other siblings. Someone said they have two kids with special needs. Um, would they need two special needs trusts or could they get by with one? I would recommend two. I mean. I, I tend to recommend to standalone supplemental needs trust for um, for them. Uh, there is um, a way to do a you know a family living trust. Um, so we could put the the separate sub trust in that family trust. Um, but again, it would probably be on a case by case basis. I would need to understand their family dynamic and 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 kind of who's going to be trustee and things like that. That that's what I would gauge before I would definitely say no. You have to have two trusts because there is a way to do it in one. Um, Thank you. So going back to the third party uh, supplemental needs trust, this, and I'll go through this quickly, it's funding and management of it is important. So um, like, for example, Allison, you all are a great resource. Like always reach out to someone that knows supplemental needs trust. Even if you appoint a trustee as a, um, a you know, a loved one, right? Like an aunt or an uncle um, or a parent, uh, they you can use trust funds to, hire professionals, you know, hire someone that's going to um, invest those funds properly so that it can last for the, the remainder of the disabled person's life. Um, you can also hire attorneys. You can use those trust funds. That is supplemental, you know, costs. Um, and, you know, funding it, um, retitle uh, in the name of that trust. You mentioned it already. It's really important to structure those beneficiary designations. Um, carefully. <laughs> I always say that. And I help my clients do that. I say, give them to me, reach out to me. I will give you specific language on how to retitle um, that bank account or retitle that beneficiary designation. Um, and then also the management of it. Uh, if you are doing it yourself, do not pay the beneficiary outright from the trust that then is income to them. You can't give them cash. Um, you can with ABLE in a, in a different way, right? We'll go over that. Um, but you need to pay the, the actual service provider or vendor. The first party, these are the payback. That, that's the, the biggest, um, you know, you know kind of difference is that the payback trust will pay back Medicaid, as I mentioned. Also, it is with the beneficiary of the trust's own funds. That's why it's first party. It's their money that is funding this trust. Um, you also can only have a first party trust if you're under the age of 65. That's another rule. Um, why use this trust? I think we already mentioned it. You, you've accidentally inherited and you didn't know in your name and you don't want to get kicked off your benefits, right? Um, uh, if you are a minor and you already have an account in your name, as you mentioned, and you turn 18, well, now all of a sudden that is your household, that is your um, income, that is your asset in your name, and you might not be able to qualify for SSI or Medicaid. Um, and I always say, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's kind of like the whoops trust, like, oh, no, we didn't have really a plan in place. So now we got to do some, you know, uh, some planning now um, so that we don't get kicked off Medicaid next month. So settlements, scholarship refunds is another one. So like if it, um, a kid with a disability is actually going to college and they get a scholarship yeah. and then there's a refund that refund would go directly to the individual. And if it's more than $2,000, that is an issue. So I know that we had to have a first party special needs trust for scholarship refunds in the past. Oh yeah, for sure. And personal injury awards, a lot of times it's, it, it has to go straight to the sure. individual that was injured. So the pooled trust, I think I mentioned, usually it's um, uh, uh, maintained, well it is maintained by a nonprofit organization. They pool resources. So you, you, you do a joinder um, to their overall trust agreement. Um, you join it, and it's it's a it's a less costly way 
um, to establish a trust. I mean, they 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 have you know um, better fees um, typically to to set it up. It but it does pull the resources. Um, I, you know, there is more a little bit more red tape. You have to have a personal representative, a care manager. I mean, there there's a lot um, that you have to go through. But it's a great option for people that need that, and they and and it's it's more of a corporate trustee vibe, but it's a nonprofit that is investing all these funds and trying to grow it, and then you have your own kind of sub account. The Arc of Texas Master Pool Trust is a great resource. Definitely reach out to them if you're interested. They are amazing at customer service. Um, you you all you know have the slides. You can go through this the benefits of uh, supplemental needs trust. I did like three examples of when you should create you know a standalone third party, um, and then when you should create first parties. Um, and then the able account. You've already touched on it, Allison, but the able account um, is an amazing tool. I always say yes. That you know, I'm so glad you're setting up a supplemental needs trust. Also, get an able account. Like it's it's such a good backup. Yes, there's a limit. Um, you cannot, you know, cannot have over a hundred thousand in it. You can only contribute eighteen thousand. But it is an amazing tax-free growth account. It's very similar to that five twenty-nine education savings plan, and you can use those funds on the qualified disability expenses. So you can actually use that money for like rent, you know, extra rent, um, extra housing, um, care, food. You can even have a prepaid card, and that. Um, disabled person can have some autonomy. They can use that card. They can go to restaurants and they can feel more independent. So the ABLE account is amazing and I do encourage everyone to look into it. Oh, the key thing that you said that, on the ABLE account. No, go ahead. No, I was gonna say two two big things about ABLE account, You uh, two other uh, kind of rules about it. You can only have one account per disabled person and the onset of disability does have to be before 26. They're trying to get that we're trying to move that number because it's silly. Um, uh, but they they have confirmed that 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 number is moving to age forty six oh. in twenty twenty six. Wonderful. So it has oh, moved. That has been approved. It's not approved. It's not starting until twenty twenty six, but it's forty six in twenty twenty six. And I just wanted to mention okay. that if the individual is working, they can contribute up to fourteen thousand five eighty for twenty twenty four, in addition to the eighteen thousand. But there was a question earlier, and I just want to mention the, 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 the why behind this. So you see the limit is 100000 So if you have more than 100000 in an ABLE account, you're going to disqualify for SSI and Medicaid. So that's why you might need the ABLE account and a special needs trust. The other thing, the key thing, is an ABLE account can pay for food and shelter without a one-third reduction to SSI. And while a special needs trust absolutely can pay for food and shelter, there would be a one-third reduction to SSI. So these tools, um, are, they work well together. It's good to have, um, to have each of them. So I know that we are just about out of time. Um, so one person asked what happens to the ABLE account when a person passes away. There is a Medicaid payback on an ABLE account as well, and any remaining balances um, that didn't go towards the Medicaid payback would be the estate of the individual with the, with a disability. So that is a good question. But think of this as a savings to spend account, and think of it as even if you had $100,000, the benefits of SSI and Medicaid that a person's going to get over their lifetime is going to be far more than whatever they're ever going to take back. Some of these Medicaid waivers, like a HCS waiver budget with um, with a level of need of nine, the, the 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 waiver budget annually is over three hundred thousand dollars a year a year. So it's pretty you know it's pretty significant. Yes. So um, one person asked, and you know we're out of time. Um, I know that you guys offer um, consultations. Do you offer um, free consultations? And where are you located? Can you work throughout the state of Texas by Zoom? Tell us a little bit more about your practice. Okay. Well, mine is different. So for Social Security Disability and SSI, I can go anywhere in the United States. So um, it's a federal law, so I can practice in any state and all over Texas. And my consultations for that are free. Yeah. And then I, I, I do, I mean, I do consultations. I will say, you know, if, if we sit down for an hour and discuss your special needs planning, th that is not free. Um, but I do take questions. So that's why I, I, I gave you my email. I will answer questions. I will, you know, um, take a phone call. Um, you know, where do I go from here? What What's going to happen? Like, absolutely, you know, of course. Um, 
that's something that I love to do. And, and, and also if you, if you do become my client, you're kind of my client forever. Um, I, I will, I tend to not charge unless it's, we have to redo our plan. I tend to not charge for all of my clients for my follow-up questions, especially my special needs clients. Um, we also, you know, put our firm as a trust protector, you know, we'll, we'll fight to make sure that that trust, um, you know, qualifies and, and meets the SSI, you know, regulations. We'll do that for you. Um, that's what we're here for. You know, we want to be a, a full disability law firm. I love this. So um, everybody, again, this has been recorded. You're going to get a copy of today's slides and their contact information, and you can set up your consultations with them to learn more about the services and how they may be able to help your family. Um, we offer free personalized consultations at CPG as well. Um, and so this QR code at the, um, at the end of the presentation will link you to a calendar where you can schedule a free personalized consultation with us as well. Thanks everyone for being here today. You guys asked awesome questions um, and thank you. It's, it's certainly my pleasure uh, to partner with you guys for the first time uh, this time and we look forward to um, continued webinars with you in the future. Thanks so much everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Yes, have a good day.